on this mimbar wearing a suit and tie, that is when you have my father's undivided attention. And so as much as any human being likes to be complimented, I was deeply saddened more than anything that there may be people out there that hinder others from benefiting from a khutbah and also from people that could forsake or dismiss their only half hour perhaps during the week to recharge because of how someone looks regardless of the content they're bringing to them. Why judge a book by its cover? And then I learned that I was wrong. And that even the phrase that we say so often, don't judge a book by its cover, it's because it is expected and natural and will always be the case, most people will judge books by their covers. It is natural for us as human beings to be drawn to something pleasing to our eyes, drawn to beauty. And that's why we need to kind of always be reminded to don't only judge by the exterior. Because that's the default. That's everything for us or for most of us. And then you think about it, why else was our Prophet ﷺ given by Allah the most beautiful face? And then the most radiant smile. And then Anas says, radiallahu anhu, مَا مَسَسْتُ قِزًّا وَلَا دِبَاجًا أَلْيَنُ مِنْ كَفِّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. I've never touched silk, velvet, whatever it may be, that is smoother than the palm of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. وَلَا شَمَمْتُ رِيحًا وَلَا عَرْفًا أَطْيَبُ مِنْ رِيحٍ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. Nor have I ever smelled any fragrance, any perfume, any musk that's more invigorating, more splendid than the fragrance of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Why was he made like that by Allah? Aside from his moral greatness, aside from his ethics that were just impeccable. Why the physical? I mean, we know because the Prophet ﷺ told us that Allah Azza wa Jal لا ينظر إلى صوركم ولا إلى أجسامكم. He doesn't look at your faces and your 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 physical exterior, your physical forms. Then why? Why be physically beautiful? And then also Allah Azza wa Jal sends the Prophet ﷺ from the noblest of ancestry, from the purest of the purest of the purest of lineages. Why? When Islam has no care for lineages, right? The Prophet ﷺ is the one that told us, If you're slowed down by your actions, you're not going to be brought back up to speed by your, who your family is. Then why was he like that? If Allah cares about inner beauty more than outer beauty, and actions more than lineage, why did he give him outer beauty? Why did he give him a beautiful ancestry? Because although Allah does not care, people care. And so it was out of the mercy of Allah that he make him that much more appealing so more people would hear him out, alayhi salatu wasalam. And consequently, more people would have a fighting chance at salvation. More people would be saved and that's what Allah azza wa wanted. And so he sent him in a way that met their expectations. In a way that satisfied their need, yes it's a need, to experience beauty. That is a human need. In fact, you know in the Qur'an, very fascinating, how Allah says, I made for you cattle, like cows and camels and horses. I made for you these four-legged animals to, to transport you and carry your luggage. But then he says, this is the point of reference. He says, وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا جَمَالٌ حِينَ تُرِيحُونَ وَحِينَ تَصْرَحُونَ And I provided for you through them, through these horses, with beauty. You know, when you behold the majesty of the horse and how it was created. It's a majestic animal. I provided for you beauty. It's a rizq from Allah that you need. You need to experience beauty. I provided for you through them beauty as you watch them go in the early morning hours out and in the early evening hours when they come back to stable. And then not just in the creation of Allah, then Allah legislated a religion. A religion that addressed that human need for beauty in a way that satisfies it from so many angles. So our Islam taught us about the importance of beauty in appearance, didn't it? Like Islam is not just okay with you looking nice. Islam promotes that you should look nice. When the Prophet wasallam he cautioned people against arrogance that no one enters paradise with a speck of arrogance in their heart, they said, Ya Rasulullah, but 
what if we like to have nice clothes and nice shoes, nice sandals? They said, he said, no, that's not it. He said, inna Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. Allah loves that you look tidy, that you look orderly, you look presentable. Allow me to say color coordinated, dressed for the occasion, without extravagance, of course. But he loves to see that from you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. For, to you, for you to comb your hair and keep it kempt. Even in, in one narration, there was a, a uh, shepherd who looked very disheveled, just very shabby. And so the Prophet ﷺ asked him, what do you do? He said, I'm a shepherd. Like, I have very laborious work. I'm out in the fields, and the dust, and the animals. He said to him, لِيَظْهَرْ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ أَوْ أَثَرَ نِعْمَةِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ Make sure the favor of Allah on you is evident. In other words, don't overburden yourself with going into debt, using money you don't have, becoming a shopaholic. No, not that one. But if Allah has given you something, show Allah's generosity to you on you. Make it visible, liyadhar, make it evident. And so that's one aspect of beauty our deen taught. Also beauty in temperament, like beauty in your mood, the people around you, the vibe they get from you. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّدْ Speak up and announce the favors of Allah on you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Speak about them not in arrogance, not in conceit, but in gratitude and in appreciation and recognition of Allah's favors. Your mood. When people are around you, what is the vibe that they get? Are you always depressed? They're always about like conspiracy theories and the world is going to end with the next president or the next uh, turn of events or... Restraining that from people is part of beauty. Just be a beautiful person. Be a, an, a positive person. That's part of beauty in your temperament, in your mood. You know Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, <coughs> he says, and Allah knows that I never knew or saw anyone that was as high-spirited as his shaykh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. He said, despite the fact that he had the most troubling life, and the most coarse conditions. He said, and the threats he would live with, and he died with, that sabotaged his entire livelihood. He said, when we would begin to assume negatively, become jaded, become like clouded regarding what is in store for us, we don't know, when we would develop anxieties, he said, we would go to him. Go to him where? Go to him in prison. You think he's the one that needs cheering up. No, they would go to him to get cheered up, and he's the one in prison. They said the moment we would look at his face and hear his words filled with positivity, filled with contentment in Allah's qadr, he said that would rejuvenate us in conviction. And it would rejuvenate us in stamina. He said, and after he died, I saw him once in a dream. And so I began to ask him about some investigation, some research I used to do about a'malul qulub wa daqaiqiha about like how the heart works and like the ideal mechanisms to purify it. Like what's the best recipe? What's the best approach to purification? So he said to me something, I'm paraphrasing here, that his entire life was all about. He said to him, Amma ana, as for me, فَطَرِيقَتِي أَصْصُرُورُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْفَرَحُ بِهِ My entire approach, it's centrally around what? About being happy with Allah being rejoicing, celebrating Allah and my relationship with Him, my connection with Him. A community member once came to me and said to me, listen brother, you need to understand something. People don't come to your masjid to gain knowledge. They're not here for the knowledge. If they want knowledge, they have YouTube. And there are way more knowledgeable people than you on YouTube. And he's absolutely right. He said, people come to you in person to see how has your knowledge made you any different. Like, are you more like content, happy with life? Are you more stable within yourself and in your marriage? Are you more endurant in the events, the trials of life that get thrown at you? That's what they're looking for. Does that Islam stuff actually work? So it's very profound. To see in you the difference that Islam made in you. Has it made you a more beautiful person? And then another aspect of beauty is a beauty in reputation. Many people have this understanding that I don't care what people think of me. I only care about what Allah Azza wa thinks of me. Well, Allah Azza wa wants you to care 
about what people think of you. Some people, for example, even in the attire we spoke about, they don't really dress up and they say, because I'm not trying to impress anyone, I don't want anything from this world. This is really a misunderstanding. Ibn al-Qayyim says actually one of the clearest signs that you don't want anything from this world is that, that you hide the fact that you don't want anything from this world. You blend in. Because you may not want clothes, you may not want uh, cars, but maybe you want people's praise, recognition, and that's why you're standing out. That's why you dress shabby. You may need to ask yourself that question. He says, أَفْضَلُ zuhd إِخْفَاءُ zuhd." One of the clearest, most superior forms of disconnecting from the dunya is to hide that you're disconnected from the dunya. I don't even want people's praise. I'm not even trying to be that guy that stands out. Distinguish myself. So caring about your reputation also is important. You know, Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, one time he was riding a ship, and a man started saying on the ship, I lost my money, who stole my money? They said, how much was your money? He said, 10,000 dirham. The problem was that al-Bukhari had a bag of money with the exact same amount. And so what did he do? He took his money and threw it in the ocean. So people are saying, like, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Like, it's haram. It's haram to waste money. He explained to them that in this situation, I'm buying my reputation with the money. I'm not wasting it. And he said to them, As-salamatu la ta'adiluha shay. Securing myself, my reputation, is priceless. Because how can I be seen as an authority that is trustworthy, that is credible, to relay to people the deen of the Prophet ﷺ, the ahadith and the sunnah, if there's like some question marks about me, we never really got to the bottom of that story about that bag we found with Al-Bukhari on that boat, right? So he's saying, I'll spend 10,000 and more to be considered a person of integrity, that it can be a relayer, a conveyor of Allah's deen. It's way worth it. And even Yusuf salam did this. You know, when Yusuf salam was accused of certain things, and his image was drawn in a very ugly way, he needed to beautify it. He felt he must beautify it. So when they came and told him, come, the king wants you, you're hired by the king, come interpret the dreams, you got a good skill set, he said, I'm not going anywhere. Go to the women and clear my name first. Ask them what the true story is. Do you know why? Because if he would not have gotten his name cleared first, he would have been a criminal that got a free pass from the king, right? The king just let it go because he kind of needed his services with dream interpretation. He would not have been seen as someone trustworthy. But he, he wanted to be released upon being cleared. And even the Prophet ﷺ admired this very much. And he said out of his humility, Yarhamullahu Yusuf. May Allah have mercy on Yusuf. If I stayed in prison for as long as he stayed, I would have responded to the caller. Like I would have heard my name and ran right out. But he insisted to stay until it was cleared because it meant that much to him. And so does our deen mean that much to us that we ensure whenever there are no red lines, whenever it's not going to anger Allah, we go out of our way to please and polish our image in front of the people? Because we will not carry to them our deen unless they see it first. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله. So we said beauty in, in appearance, attire, and in your mood, your temperament, your personality, and also in your reputation. Also very important is beauty in your performance or your work ethic, your diligence, being a perfectionist as much as you can without stagnating yourself. Some people are, if they're too bent on perfectionism, their whole life paralyzes. And it comes to a halt. But doing everything within your power, that's not unreasonable to be a perfectionist. You know even the hadith of Al-Mu'min Al-Qawi, the, the strong believer is more beloved to Allah and superior than the weak believer, but there's good in every believer. What was the context of that hadith? It was performance. Ista'in billahi wa la Seek Allah's help, don't quit, don't be a quitter. Don't be that person that the moment there's an obstacle, you're aborting the mission. That's about what? Due diligence, perfectionist, personality. You need to be like a person of excellence. 
And in the other hadith, the Prophet says, Inna Allah yuhibbu idha amila ahadukum amlan an yutqinahu. Allah loves when you do any deed, any deed, that you perfect it. You know the context of that hadith as well is very telling. In some other narrations of this hadith, they said we were going on a janazah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and when we got to the grave site, the grave was not yet dug. And so we had to wait, and as they were digging the grave, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to them, sawu lahda hadha. Smoothen or level the lahd. The lahd is like the enclave or that niche that they build at the side. The grave goes down, and then you're supposed to build a little bit to tuck the deceased person inside. That is how, whenever it's in our ability to bury our dead, we're supposed to bury our dead that way. He said, smoothen it. He says, فَظَنَّ النَّاسُ أَنَّهَا sunnah." The people thought this was like a ritual, that you have to like perfect the enclave. And so the Prophet ﷺ had to clarify for them, no, 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 that's not what I meant. Meaning, don't think this is a particular practice that you just open-endedly address. Or else you can imagine over the years they'll put a pillow inside and make it into a shrine become wasteful and aggrandize the deceased, it becomes very problematic. But when he saw them about to go overboard, he said to them what? He said, What I told you to do of leveling the inside of the grave, smoothening it, will not benefit the deceased or harm him. It's not about comfort. He said, But it's really about the fact that Allah loves when a doer does something, they do it with excellence. They perfect it. To be a person of its qan in all the things that you do. You know, this is not supposed to be hard for us Muslims if we take our Islam seriously, right? Because the ABCs of our deen, the building blocks, wudu is supposed to be done with isbaq, which means to be thorough in your wudu. And then you're not supposed to go to prayer while restraining yourself, the need, the impulse to go to the bathroom. That's another hadith, right? And you're not supposed to run to the prayer. Because what's the point of getting there if, if you're just hyperventilating, you're breathing fast? It's about quality. It's not just about showing up. And then you're supposed to come to a full stop anyway in every posture. And whoever doesn't, the Prophet ﷺ said, go back and pray you haven't prayed. Because he was bouncing out of postures. Even eating, by the way. Simplistic day-to-day -day activities, he forbid us from eating while standing. Like, hey, be mindful as you eat. Sit down in the moment of what you're doing, do that well. If we were to take these things seriously, the early Muslims took them seriously. And so they built around them a civilization that was all about raising the bar, that was all about this detail, that was all about this perfection. You know, even the, the structure, the architecture that is symbolic of Islamic history, like the Andalusian arches and all these things, these were produced by the Islamic civilization. You know, even the script of Arabic, if you go to the earliest Arabs, the Arabic script was hideous. It was very crude, and it wasn't consistent, and it wasn't artistic. None of that was there. And then Islam's insistence on its Khan made this something symbolic of the Muslim culture and something so desirable that people that have no idea what the Arabic says still want a piece of that in their house, right? And so finally, I only have six minutes left. There is so much to be said about this subject because it can be found in every angle of our deen. But just remember this one hadith, and then I'll give you some action items. When the Prophet ﷺ said that excellence, ihsan, perfection, beauty, all those are used for ihsan, has been prescribed for you on everything, what did he say? He said, and even when one of you slaughters, at the end of the hadith, perfect the slaughter, sharpen the blade, and put the animal to rest. And the Sahaba spoke about what that means. So not, don't slaughter it in front of the other. Don't let it wait in front of the knife as you're sharpening the knife. Put it to as much ease as possible. But what's the connection? Look at the, the eloquence of the example. Perfection is written on everything, meaning everything in your life deserves a share of your perfection. Excellence, due diligence, beauty. Do everything beautifully, even the things that are to be imagined the furthest from it, right? Even when you slaughter something, it still applies there. He used the farthest example for you to understand that it applies to everything else automatically. And so where do we get this from? We already said the basics of Islam. You do your wudu right, you do your salah right, 
it will start becoming a part of your personality. Also, where do you find Ihsan? It's very easy. Just look around. Look at the perfection of Allah's design of the universe. Ahsana kulla shay'in khalaqahu. He created everything with great Ihsan. Perfect design, impeccable design. Sun Allahi ladhi atqana kulla shay'. Look at the design of Allah that Allah who designed everything with itqan, with fine-tuned excellence. Like Allah Azza wa Jal could have created the heavens and the earth in an instant, right or wrong? Be and it would be. It was created over six days, why? The scholar said perhaps Allah Azza wa Jal is showing for us the, the universal order, how things are supposed to be done. For us to realize that detail takes time on our clock, in our world. That's how our universe functions. Even think about your day, today. When, when it's night time, do the lights just go out in the universe? Like, does it just turn black? Or is there a gradual, gentle onset of the night? Gentleness is a part of beauty. It's a part of excellence. Allah is showing it to you in the world around you. It's even mentioned that one of the, uh, the parents was telling his child, look at how Allah beautifully put everything together. And so the child, being as inquisitive as children are, he said, but this doesn't make sense. Look, the, the watermelon grows on this like flimsy vine. And this huge date tree only lets off fruits this big. He's trying to say the watermelon should be on a bigger plant and the dates should be on a smaller plant. Doesn't make sense. So his father didn't answer him. Perhaps he was stumped like we're stumped so many times with our kids. It's interesting out-of-the-box questions. Until one time the child was napping under one of those date palms and one of the dates fell and hit him in the head and he said what was that his father said to him just thank Allah it wasn't a watermelon that's part of and I I don't mean to prompt laughter in the khutbah but the idea is if you give it the time of day you will realize you will benefit so much from reflecting on the itqan of Allah in his sunnah in his manufacture and the last thing is the incentive Allah wa ta'ala said and this should certainly be enough لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةً For the people of Ihsan, the people of excellence, beauty, perfection, their repayment is what? It's not Ihsan, it's Al-Husna. Al-Husna is the absolute most excellent. It's the superlative if you're into language. It's the absolute most excellent reward and more. Because sometimes, you know, when we know we're getting paid because the surveillance camera is running or I'm clocked in front of my supervisors, you show up on time and you do your due diligence. When you know there's incentive for being at the gate of your plane early and there's a penalty for, for taking this too lightly. But then in other spaces, it's like what? It's not like it's my job. It's not like I'm getting paid. No, you're getting paid. And you're getting paid with a reward that is matchless. It's al-husna. Your payment is nothing less than al-husna. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, al-husna is jannah. What the most creative mind can never imagine. What humanity collectively can never conjure up. Waziyada and more. What is the only thing greater than the greatest creation, Jannah, is the one who created it himself. That's what's more. He said, Ziyada, that which is more, is Allah Azza wa Jal's face that you get to see. Ru'ya tu wajhillahi ta'ala. May Allah grant us and you that. That is certainly enough incentive when you're thinking about the concept of a Muslim employee, how conscientious should I be? Muslim appointments amongst ourselves. Thinking about the language we use at home. Thinking about leaving bathrooms and shoe racks cleaner than we found them. May Allah return us to being an ummah of ihsan, an ummah of beauty, and make us worthy and credible in the eyes of those that are in need of the torch that we carry. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma ghfir lana warhamna. Allahumma ghfir lana warhamna. Wa ila ghayrika la takilna. اغفر لنا ما قدمنا وما أخرنا وما أسررنا وما أعلنا وما أنت أعلم به منا أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر وأنت على كل شيء قدير اللهم اغفر لنا هزلنا وجدنا وخطأنا وعمدنا وكل ذلك عندنا اللهم آتي نفوسنا تقواها زكيها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها يا قديم الإحسان يا من إحسانه فوق كل إحسان يا من أعطيتنا خير ما في خزائنك وهو الإيمان لا تحرمنا أوسع ما في خزائنك وهو العفو مع السؤال اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا